Here we go, roll right into it. Here we go. I just wanna break you forever and ever and ever and ever for you die for me. Blessing and glory. Blessing and glory. Y'all sing it at home. And honor. Pieces of silver. 
and the fourth part of the calf of a dove dog for five pences of silver. Let me translate that to Living Bible translation. It says later on, King ben Benadad had attacked Syria. He mustered his entire army and besieged it and attacked Samaria. As a result, there was a great famine in the city. After a long while, even a donkey's head was sold for $50. And a pint of pigeon poop was brought for $3. Now, amen. What does that mean? Uh, right now, we see that gas is gone through the roof. Gas is gone through the roof. They said that when this was happening, you could buy a donkey's head for $50. So imagine this. You don't even eat donkey. But things had got so desperate that people was eating things that they never ate. They said that you can buy a cup of dookie from a bird for $3. So that means that there weren't even any birds left. The only thing that they could eat was the dookie of the bird. So I want you to imagine that. It was desperate time. It was desperate time. And, and some of you are laughing. How is it that we can eat the, the poop of a bird? That's impossible. I would never eat that. Have you ever been hungry? Have you ever been really hungry? See, when you get hungry, you'll eat anything. In fact, if you keep reading, if you keep reading, it goes down where there were two mothers. And the mothers had traded babies. And they said, well, today, if you cook my baby, we can eat your baby tomorrow. It had got so desperate that they started eating children because they were hungry. There was a war in the land. There was a war in the land, and the war caused prices to go sky high. People couldn't afford food anymore. And as you approach the gas pump, see, and you're looking at it, you're thinking about, should I pay my cable bill, or should I buy gas? Should I buy food, or should I buy gas? Should I pay my cell phone bill, or should I buy gas? This is what was happening in the land. But what the Bible says is this. Turn to Philippians 4.19. Philippians 4.19, way in the back. Thank you, Jesus. Philippians 4.19. Philippians 4 19 says this, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glories through Christ Jesus. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glories by Christ Jesus. Jesus says this, regardless of what's happening in the world, regardless of how high the gas prices is, regardless of how high food is, regardless of how high the rent is, regardless of how, whatever's going on, he says he shall supply. So when you put your trust in God, he will make a way out of no way. He will make a way through times that don't seem like you can get through. That's why we put our trust in God. Matter of fact, turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 23. Psalm 37, verse 23. Psalm 37, verse 23. Psalm 37, 23 says this. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. Then it says, though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholded him with his hand. Verse 25. And then it says this. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for food. And then it says in verse 26, He is ever merciful and lending, and his seed is blessed. In verse 25 it says, I have been young, but now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. God makes his promise. He says this, if you put him first, he says he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He says your children won't even go without. He says you will have everything that you always need because God will order your steps. God will order your steps and point you in the direction of blessing. Everybody else can be cursed around you except you because God will keep you. He will bless you in spite of what's going on around you. Everybody else can't get gas. You got gas. Everybody else struggling, but you blessed because God will keep you and he will prosper you regardless of what's going on around you. Next, turn me to 2 Samuel 22. 2 Samuel 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22. 
Go down to verse 2. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Go down to verse 2. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Go down to verse 2. And it says, and he said, the Lord is my rock. This is David speaking. And my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my high tower and my refuge and my savior. And thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So I shall be saved from my enemies. When the waves of death surround me, and when the floods of the ungodly men make me afraid, the sorrows of hell compass about me, the snares of death try to stop me. In my distress, I will call upon the Lord. And he cried unto the word of God. And God heard his voice out of the temple, and made a cry is entered into his ears. Jesus said, when you are in despair, call on the name of the Lord. This was David speaking. He says, in hard time, learn how to call on the name of the Lord. When you stressed out, learn how to call on the name of the Lord. When you sad, learn how to call on the name of the Lord. When you happy, learn how to call on the name of the Lord. Regardless of what you're going through, learn how to call God's name. Because if you keep calling God's name, that means you're in connection with God. So regardless of what you're going through, God is going to make a way and see you through. Learn how to continue and keep calling on the God's name. Because stress is dangerous. Stress can kill you. Stress can destroy you. Stress can make you smoke stress. Stress can make you drink stress. You got to learn how to call on God's name. Because the saddest thing is, we think we can solve our problems. And God says, you can't fix what you didn't create. Let God be the source. Let God be the solution to what you're going through. Call God and he will solve your problems. Next, turn to 2 Chronicles 30. 2 Chronicles 30. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Go down to verse 17. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Go down to verse 17. This is my passage here. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Go down to verse 17. It says, there were, for there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Oh, that's me. Therefore, the Levites had the charge of killing the Passover for everyone that was not clean. That's also me. To sanctify them unto the Lord. Verse 18. For a multitude of the people, even as many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun had not cleansed themselves. Yet they did eat of the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardons everyone that prepared his heart to seek God. The Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary and hearken unto Hezekiah, he healed the people. Let me translate that. There was a group of men. There was a group of men. And they had gone to church. And they had a great feast at the church. And at the church, the only people who could partake of the feast had to be sanctified. They were good. They were clean. They, 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 were, they were holy people. Those were the people who were able to partake of the feast. But see, some sinners showed up to the church who were dirty. Who, who were still had their sin. The alcohol was still fresh on their breath. Uh, they had the condom in their pocket. They showed up to the church. And Hezekiah saw these men. He said this. Come on over here. And the men were like, what? He says, you guys are worthy. Just like we're worthy. Because God forgives us all. What does that mean to you and I? You will never get too low where God won't believe in you. You will never get too low where God won't trust you. You will never get too low where God won't bless you. Because God sees you. God knows you. And regardless of what you're going through, there's some good left in you. Never think that you're disqualified because of what you went through. Never think that you're disqualified because of your story. God knew that you would have that story. And in spite of your story, there's blessings for you. 
You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are important. You are important enough to God that he woke you up this morning. That means you still have purpose in this life. Just like these men that showed up dirty, still sick in their sins. Hezekiah saw the good in them. He says, you're worthy. Come up here just like everybody else. You, if we eat, you go eat. And he blessed them with the same blessings. And the powerful part about this blessing was, after they, eat, after they ate, God healed their situations. Because it was the heart. It was the faith that was in their heart that caused them to even come to the church. So never think that you're disqualified because of your story. Because God said there's good in you. In fact, turn to Hebrews 4 and 16. Thank you, Jesus. Hebrews 4 and 16. Hebrews 4 and 16. It says, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. When those men came to church, they were sinners. They came to church. They were still high. They came to church. They just left the party in the strip club. But they knew that there was something at the church that they needed. See, the church is not a place of perfection. The church is a hospital. See, this place is where you come to to get better. Uh, I grew up in the old church, and in the old church, if, if you went to the club, you're going to hell. If you had a drink, you're going to hell. If you had sex, you're going to hell. If you had a baby out of wedlock, you're going to hell. You was going to hell for everything. And what they did was they stopped people from coming to church that needed to be in church. See, in the church of life, we don't judge nobody. You want to come in here high? That's fine. You want to come in here drunk? That's fine. You want to come in here in whatever condition you in? That's fine. Because God called you here to get better. I can't make you better. I'm not God. But if you walk with him, your situation will change. You will start to elevate. You will start to get better. And you become a better person than you were yesterday. God says you're worthy. He says you come here to obtain grace. And grace suits my case. Because I'm not worthy to be a pastor. I'm not even worthy to be a father. I'm not worthy to be married. I'm not worthy to be anything. But God says, grace. And what grace is, is when God gives you what you don't deserve. Some of y'all got jobs based on grace. Some of y'all got cars based on grace. Some of y'all living in a house based on grace. Some of y'all is in relationships based on grace. It's yeah. God's grace that got you there. Mm. God will give you his grace to give you what you don't deserve, to let you know that he's still there. Give God a hand clap for grace. Hallelujah. Because it's by grace that you have the opportunity to continue to do what God told you to do. Turn to the book of Judges. Judges. We almost done. Book of Judges. I got to go home and grade papers. We almost done. Judges chapter 1. Verse 1. Thank you, Jesus. Judges chapter 1. Verse 1. Judges chapter 1. Verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. It says, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel, Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? So let's think about this. These children were in a situation where their leader had died. So it's sort of like a family. The daddy had died. And they're asking, who's going to fight for us? Because now daddy's gone. Uh, our fighter is gone. Uh, uh, the job I had to depend on is gone. Uh, the, the house I lived in is gone. Whatever you depended on is gone. What do you do when you have to face life by itself? What do you do when you have to figure out how to make this thing work and you don't know how to make it work? Here's what happened. They went and they asked God. And the Lord said, verse 2, And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. 
Behold, I had delivered the whole land into his hands. What does that mean? The word Judah, 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 is Hebrew for praise. So God said, when you're faced with a situation and it don't make sense, and you scurred, and you don't have no help, and you don't know what you're doing, the first thing he said to do is send up praise. God says, when praises go up, blessings come down. In fact, turn to the book of Psalms, book of Psalms 67. Thank you, Jesus. Psalm 67, verse 3. Psalm 67, thank you, Jesus. Verse 3. It says, let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Selah. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then thou shalt ye then the earth shall yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. Verse 7. God shall bless us all, and all ends of the earth shall fear him. When you give God praise, he opens up the earth and he releases blessings. So let's say, let's say, today I got a call from a young lady, and she's actually in medical school. She called me today. She says, Pastor, I want you to pray for me because I'm getting ready to take my exam to become a doctor. So the powerful part is she called me. But here's what she got to do. She got to start saying, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Before she take that test, she's supposed to be jumping up and down, giving God praise. Because what's going to happen is when she give God praise, God's going to open up the window. He's going to release blessings, and the answers all going to appear right on that test. Because when you give God the praise, he'll give you the victory. If you learn how to give God the praise, right now, while you're young and you don't have what you think you should have, imagine what you're going to have in the future. God is going to bless you with more than you can imagine. He's going to give you more than you're going to think about. Because if you learn how to give him the praise when you have nothing, imagine what your life will be when you have something. Amen. So we have to learn how to praise God with meager fare. You have to learn how to praise God with a negative bank account. You got to learn how to praise God sitting on the metro bus stop. You got to learn how to praise God with look eating top running. You got to learn how to praise God when you about to go to prison. You got to learn how to praise God regardless of what situation you in. Because when you send up praise, blessings come down. Learn how to give God the praise that he deserves. And the very last thing, turn with me, turn with me. The Psalm 119, 73. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We've got to learn how to pray to God. Psalms 119 and 73. 119 and 73. Psalm 119 and 73. And that, that spoke to me because I've been in some situations where it didn't look right. And today God has blessed it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Psalm 119, 73. It says, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. And then it says, give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. God says, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. Let's put a pause in that. God made you. So since God made you, he is the only one that's authorized to fix you. God made you. See, the thing is, we think we can fix ourselves. We meditate. We smoke. We, we burn sage around the house. Uh, we do yoga. We do all these different things. We, we go to counseling. We, we go get degrees. We do everything except give it to God. Because God's the only one who's authorized to fix us. We can't change in of ourselves. You don't have the power to change you. You don't have the power to change your circumstance. You don't have the power to change anything around you. But God does because God knows you. God has the authority and the power to change you. In fact, turn to Nehemiah. 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 Chapter 9, verse 2. Nehemiah. Chapter 9. Verse 2, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 2. 
It says, and the seed of Israel separated themselves from all the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquity of their fathers. And they stood up in the place and read in the book of the Lord, of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day. That means they prayed for eight hours a day. And another fourth part of the day they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Why is this so powerful? Many of us have generation curses in our family. Raise your hand if you got a generation curse in your family. That's powerful. These families had generation curses. And they came to church, and this Sunday morning, they wanted to get purified of these curses. So what they started to do was, they started communication. They started confessing their sins. But they, they wasn't confessing their sins to God. See, why are you telling God your sin? He already knows what you did. They started confessing their sins to one another. And talking about the generation curses that were in their families. Most of the curses in our families, we ignore. We ignore that uncle that touched everybody. We ignore. We ignore that father that touched the girl the wrong way. We ignore. And because we ignore these things, it just keeps going on from generation to generation to generation. We don't talk about the alcoholism in our families. We don't talk about the drug addiction in our families. We don't talk about the fact that nobody can stay married in our families. We don't talk about the fact that everybody got baby dad, baby mamas in our families. And because we ignore it, it keeps going on and on. In this situation, these people went to church and they said, I want to break this thing. I'm tired of watching my children do the same thing that I did. It, it, it's powerful. I'll talk to a young lady this week. I promise you. I'll talk to a young lady this week. Long story short, her sister has a mother that died. Okay, that happens. But the powerful thing is, the daughter didn't really know the mother because the mother died when she was very small. But the daughter that didn't know the mother is just like the mother that died. And the thing is, it amazed the older sister because she's looking at her like, what the heck? How, she don't even have to. And, and what the thing is, there's DNA. See, most of your generation curses are attached to your DNA. That's why you have to give it to God and let him break that thing. Because if we give it to God, he can change our formula. He can change it because God made us. He's the one that put us together. Give it to God and watch him break the things that we can't break in of our own. And the last thing, last thing, turn to Jeremiah 13, 23. Jeremiah 13, 23. Thank you, Jesus. Jeremiah 13, 23. Jeremiah 13, 23. Jeremiah 13, 23. It says, can a black man change his, the color of his skin? Can a leopard change his spot? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to doing evil. Can a black man change the color of his skin? Can a leopard change his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to doing evil. God says, you can't change you. You can't change you. I, I know people who used to be alcoholics, but now they feel powerful. And the thing is, they say, I changed. All you did was change addiction. You ain't changed. Uh, I used to be a whole mother. Now I'm a sweet mother. The thing is, I'm still addicted. I'm just addicted to a different thing. But when you give it to God, and you say, God, I'm tired of this. Can you change me? God will reach down and, and will move some things around in your life and will take the taste out of your mouth. Thank you, Sister Tanisha. She taught me that today. God will reach down and touch you and move the things and move some things and push them out of your life and allow you to really be changed so that you don't have the same desires and the same taste that you once had. Because at the end of the day, God loves you. And he loves you with the evidence. The thing is, God loves you just how you are. And all he asks you to do is be in relationship with him. Read your Bibles. Come to church when you can. Pay your tithes if God has blessed you with money. And watch God transition and change your life. Will you be perfect? No. But you'll be better than you once was. 
and the people around you will start to see you. And they won't believe that God does did, did these things for you. Because the thing was, my name used to be Dirty Mike, Player Mike, Nasty Mike, Pimp Mike. Now they call me Pastor Mike. See, that's the powerful transition. And the Bible says God will use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Be a fool for God and he will bless you so much that people around you won't even recognize that you used to be you. Church, trust God and watch it change the situation of your life. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Everybody stand. Low battery. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. 